This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about the waiver renewal for the IB waiver and review all the services that are included in the renewal. The effective date of the waiver is October 1st, 2019. First of all, we'll talk about what is a waiver. Everyone who has a Medicaid, who is Medicaid eligible receives a Medicaid card. And with that card, they, are, they have access to certain services such as hospital stays, emergency room visits, pharmacy services, doctor visits, some medical supplies, and some durable medical equipment. These are called state plan covered services. To, um, and it's available to everyone that has Medicaid. A waiver request to Medicaid to allow services to a group of individuals that are specific and not include and to waive state plan services uh, to a distinct population. For the ID waiver, what we have done is come in and design services to fit those persons who meet our eligibility criteria. I think we've covered this before as far as, you know, what are state plan services? Just remember that all state plan services have to be utilized prior to expending waiver funds. So these are two websites. This one right here will get you to the provider manual is um, what I want you to be aware of is that Medicaid upgrades, um, well, they um, update their manuals every six months. And so you wanna make sure that um, you are pulling the most recent updated manual. You wanna pay particular attention to chapter 14 and appendix P, those will give you the um, durable medical equipment that's covered by state plan services. It will also give you a list of medical supplies. The second link here will give you um, a, the fee schedule and how much um, Medicaid pays on certain items. And it's in an Excel spreadsheet, so you can just scroll down through there and look at the billing codes. Um, so just wanted you to be aware of that. <clears throat> For this renewal, just um, here, I wanted to go over what has been added and what the difference, what the changes are in the waiver. So the statutory services are here. Statutory services just mean that those are the services included in the in the statute or the federal guidelines. Day habilitation, we've added a community day component. For that, so we'll be covering that in just a minute. There were no changes to employment supports. Personal care, we put some limits on personal care and we changed the supervisory visits. Prevocational services, we again added a, a component for community prevocational. Residential habilitation was not changed. Respite services have not changed. Adult companion services, the supervisory visit requirement has changed somewhat. No changes to benefits and career counseling. Um, we did have, we did make some changes on community experience, and so there's some limitations on that service. We have deleted community specialist service. No changes to environmental accessibility adaptations. No changes to housing stabilization services. No changes to occupational speech therapy or physical therapy. Skilled nursing services have not changed. PERS, um, on the positive behavior supports, we have removed the self-directed option. On medical equipment, we changed the name to assistive technology. No changes to specialized medical supplies no changes to supported employment transportation, and we have added a new service called Supported Living Services. Remember that waiver services are not an entitlement. 
They are not provided as a remedial benefit to the waiver participant or family, but to improve the quality of life, improve health and safety, or increase the participant's independence and community integration. Waiver services are provided based on the best need to the participant. I wanted to show you um, how the waiver looks and when we go in and do in, um, a waiver renewal. In Appendix C of um, the waiver renewal, you, this is what it looks like when you go in and, and do and, and change services or add a service or define services. So just wanted you to be aware of how this looks and this is what, uh, when we submit it, the, the federal government at CMS actually looks at and to approve our waivers. So just wanted to ha you to have that information. This is um, the provider summary, and again, you can you can have as dip, many different providers um, on some services, but you have to have one for each provider of service and the requirements. So we're going to start with day habilitation services. It's expected to be delivered in the community. Sorry. This one is facility-based. It includes planning, training, coordination, and support. It's designed to enable and increase independence, um, physical health, socialization, and community integration. It includes, is included in the 4,940 total allowable units in the 247 days, 248 days if it's a late year. There are four basic levels, and it's based on um, the ICAP scores. They can include the transportation cost, and it's limited to five hours each day. So the ratio now, which one, we did change that in the new waiver renewal, it used to be um, 1 to 15 or 1 to 1. Now we've changed level 1 to 1 to 15, level 2 to 1 to 12, level 3 is 1 to 8, and level 4, of course, is level um, remains at 1 to 1. Community day hab is another component of day hab services. It's not broken down into a different um, service. However, it will have its own established billing code, so you need to be aware of that. Medicaid is working on uh, actually getting those new services and changes um, that we requested loaded into the billing system. So once we hear from them, then we will um, load them into the data system and you will be able to bill for these services. They can, the community day habilitation can include activities such as volunteering, community integration activities that are, should be designed to create an avenue of independence and autonomy for the participant. Um, all services should be included in the person center plan. The ratios stay the same according to the ICAP level. So level one, your ratio should be one to four. There's the new rate. It pays $4.16 um, an hour. I mean, I'm sorry, for a 15 minute unit. Um, if transportation is provided, then that would be $4.80 per 15 minute unit. Level two, the ratio is one to three. The rate without transportation is $4.76. The rate with transportation is $5.40. Level three, the ratio should be now one to two in the community. The rate is without transportation is $5.94 a unit. With transportation, $6.58 a unit. Level four, of course, is one to one ratio. The rate is nine dollars and six cents without transportation nine dollars and seventy cents with transportation this does count towards the four thousand nine hundred forty units per year it should be be delivered in according to the individual's person center plan <clears throat> and then the ratio outlined above individuals with similar interest may be taken into the community based on common interest and out an outing range for all individuals receiving facility day habilitation would not be considered community day habilitation. 
Day services can only be billed for 247 days, 248 days in the late year per waiver participant. Now we're going to talk about community experience. <clears throat> Please note that community experience has changed and can only be billed by those providers who have transformed their system and are providing 100% community-based services. So this means that they have completely closed all their facilities and they're meeting people in the community and delivering those services in the community. There's two distinct types of community experience. <clears throat> Individual, which is one-on-one, -on -one, and group, and to please note this, in the previous waiver, it was one to four. Now the ratio has changed from one to four to one to three. Community experience group is customized for the individual. It provides out, is provided outside the person's residence. It engages the person in an activity designed to improve their skills. It's present on the person-centered plan and on the plan of care. Individual community experience is delivered one-on-one. -on -one. The need for the service is based on the ICAP and the HRST scores, if we have one, and behavioral assessment may be indicated. The purpose of this service is in, to improve access to the community through increased skills, natural support, and less paid support. Community experience services cannot be provided in the participant's home or during the same time the participant is receiving residential habilitation since community integration is part of that service. Community experience individual and group can only be billed by providers of day habilitation during the normal day habilitation hours and cannot overlap residential services. Community experience groups should not be used to facilitate group activities that would normally be um, provided by a day habilitation provider. The rate has increased um, somewhat for the ratio one to one. It's $9.70 per 15 minute unit. The rate for group would be one to, the ratio is one to three, and the rate is $6.10 per 15 minute unit. It's limited to five hours per day. It counts toward the 4,940 units per year. It should not be billed for day habilitation or community day help services. And it can include volunteering, should be driven by the person center plan. November 1, the fiscal offices will begin changing authorizations from those currently receiving community experience the authorizations will be changed from community experience to community day habilitation for those that are receiving that service where the provider also has a day facility. Um, it will be authorized at the same level that is currently authorized. We're simply just going to change the service. The support coordinator will need to update the plan of care for each one of these participants involved. So now let's talk about supported employment. Again, there was not any changes in the waiver to this, so um, just to recap what we've already provided in an other trainings supported this is the federal definition by the way supported employment individual employment supports may also include supports to establish or maintain self-employment including home-based self-employment supported employment services are individualized and may include any combination of the following services vocational or job related discovery or assessment person-centered employment planning job placement job development negotiation with a prospective employer, job analysis, job carving, training, and systematic instruction, job coaching, benefits and work incentive planning and management, transportation, asset development and career advancement services, 
other workplace support services, including services not specifically related to job skills training that enable the waiver participant to, success, to be successful in integrating into a job setting. There's two types of supported employment, small group that goes from anywhere from two to eight persons and individual. Small group can include mobile crews, business-based work, work groups employment. Individuals has, has two components, job development and job coaching. Job development limits, is limited right now to 40 hours per year per to waiver participant. Job coaching is limited to the 836 hours per year per participant as fading is expected to occur. And so there is some uh, not written in stone, but just some guidance on how the fading could look and what the provider can do to start that fading process and still get paid um, for that service. Both services are intended for those requiring the service to obtain and maintain employment. Both services are intended to assist the individual in, in obtaining and maintaining competitive integrated employment at or above minimum wage. Both are intended to fade and replace with natural support. Both are billed in 15-minute increments. They cannot be provided in a shelter workshop. They cannot be provided for volunteer work. They cannot be provided if VR services are available, and it does not include transportation. Assessment discovery is, um, is also uh, another service for this. Uh, included in supported employment. It's a, and it's a one-time, time-limited and targeted service designed to help an individual to pursue individualized integrated employment or self-employment to identify through person-centered assessment, planning and exploration, strong interest toward one or more specific aspects of, aspects of the labor market to identify skills, strengths, and other contributions that likely to be valuable to employers are valuable to the community if offered through the self-employment and conditions necessarily for successful employment or self-employment. It may involve a comprehensive analysis of the person's histories, interviews with families, friends, and support staff, observing the person performing work skills, and career research in order to determine the person's career interests, talent skills, support needs, and choice, and the writing of a profile, which may be paid through waiver funds in order to provide a ballot assessment for, voc for vocational rehabilitation services. So the, this service is actually designed to really assess the person to make sure that when we make the referral to vocational rehab, when the person is interviewed by the vocational rehab counselor, they're truly interested in obtaining employment. Here's some more um, information about supported about the discovery. Um, <clears throat> It's limited to right now to 100 units, um, 25 hours a day. So it tells you how you can build that service out. So it's a 90-day time-limited um, service. So the report, the final report, is expected to be provided um, to the case management and put in, put in the person's file within the 90-day time frame. In order to provide some payment, then we've broken that down into um, different units and when you can, when the provider can bill for those services so they don't have to go 90 days without some sort of reimbursement. Again, the, the whole process is designed to help identify what that person is actually interested in doing and what, and to identify their, their strengths and weaknesses. Now we're going to talk about supported employment transportation. This used to be emergency supported employment transportation, but we changed that somewhat. And the unit of service is a mile. There must be documentation in the client's file that says that all other transportation 
options have been explored. It is expected that as part of the person-centered planning process and employment outcomes, that long-term transportation to and from the work site will be facilitated and arranged. It will be based on the current IRS mileage rate, which right now is 58 cents per mile. It can be provided by public carriers, commercial transportation, day habilitation providers, um, and also any residential provider. And the reason we did this was to uh, alleviate any barriers to somebody who may go to work at three o'clock in the afternoon and the day have provider may need to take that person to work, but by the time that person gets off at seven o'clock, then that would be the residential provider's responsibility to go pick that person up. So we did not want that to be a barrier. So either one of them can provide that service. So please read over that carefully so you understand um, what's required when you're billing for that service. Pre-vocational services. This service did not change in the waiver. Here's the federal definition. What I want to talk, um, point out is that it's designed um, to be provided for learning and work experience. It can include volunteer work um, where the individual can develop general non-job specific tasks strengths and skills that contribute to employability in, in paid employment and in an integrated community setting. The services are expected to occur over a defined period of time and with specific outcomes to be achieved. Again, this is the federal definition, so pay attention to that. They came in several years ago and, and um, guidance to the state to limit that service so it's not an ongoing service, it's time limited. Um, individuals receiving pre-vocational services must have employment-related goals in their person-centered plan. The general habilitation activities must uh, be designed to support such employment goals. Okay, so let's recap what I just said. It's just that pre-vocational services are designed to create a pathway to employment. They're designed to teach concepts such as attendance, task completion, problem solving, interpersonal relations, and safety. It does not include teaching job specific tasks. Employment related goals should be on the individual's person center plan. It should match the job with the individual's interests, strengths, priorities, and abilities and capabilities. Pre-vocational services are delivered for the purpose of furthering habilitation goals leading to employment. They prepare the participant for integrated employment. They should enable attainment of, a high, of the highest possible level of work. They prepare the participant to earn wages at or above minimum wage. They must address the transportation needs. They can be delivered in the community. It is time limited to 2,470 units over the lifetime of the individual. It is the provider's responsibility to track the number. So just want to make you aware of that. The service should not be available through vocational rehabilitation or the local education agency. It requires supporting documentation of services delivered. And again, we, we assume that at the end of those 2,470 units, the person um, should be referred to VR. CMS has come in and again, in guidance to the state, they say that pre-vocational services is not a required prerequisite for individuals or small group supported employment services um, provided under the waiver. So that means exactly that each person should be handled individualized, individually, and that based on their capabilities and what they need, then 
that's the length of time that they should stay in pre-vocational if it's necessary. However, some people may not need pre-vocational services. So it, the service is not linear. It's not you go into pre-vocational and then you go into supported employment. Somebody may go from, you know, being in a day facility directly to employment. I just wanted to point that out to you. Okay, in this waiver um, renewal, we did add pre community pre-vocational services. So this would be services that are designed to be delivered in the community. It follows the same guidelines as the, we just went over in the pre-vocational services and must be present in the person-centered plan with the participant expressing a desire for employment. That must be documented in the person-centered plan. It can be delivered at places within the community. It can include a variety of activities, but all the activities should be supported by the person's individual goals for improvement in some area. The rate currently for pre-vocational in the facility is $12.20 per unit. The unit for this service is an hour. So we've increased that to $24.40 for community pre-vocational services. Providers should document explicitly activities in the community and how that relates to the person, the participant's goals. It should count toward the 4,940 total units. Again, the unit for this is an hour. The documentation should support the person-centered plan and the goals established designed to assist the participant to obtain employment. Now let's talk about benefits planning. Benefits planning, as defined by the federal government, is career planning in a person-centered, comprehensive employment that includes employment planning and support services to provide assistance for waiver program participants to obtain, maintain, or advance in competitive employment or self-employment. It is a focused, time-limited service engaging a participant in identifying a career direction and developing a plan for achieving competitive, integrative employment at or above the state's minimum wage. The outcome of this service is documentation of the participant's stated career objective and a stated plan used to guide the individual employment support. There's two distinctive services. The first one is benefits counseling. The second one is benefits reporting. Benefits counseling is the extensive service provided by a Community Work Incentives Coordinator, or CWIC, who will receive referrals from the um, benefits reporting service um, person, case managers, family, friends, central office, wherever those, those referrals come from. The CWIC will provide intensive individualized benefits counseling, benefits analysis, develop a work incentives plan, and ongoing benefits planning for participants who may change jobs or for career advancement or get raises in the current position. The CWIC is employed by ADRS, funded by ADMH, the DD division, but can be employed by a provider. The, the ones funded by ADMH, DD division should be, should be housed in each of the regional offices. The service is billed in 15 minute increments and cannot uh, exceed the 20 units, I mean, sorry, 60 units or 15 hours per year per waiver participant. Benefits reporting service. The benefits reporting is, service is designed to assist waiver participants and families to understand general information on how SSI and SSDI benefits are affected by employment. The benefits reporting specialist will be employed by a provider agency. They will receive referrals from a variety of sources, including case managers, families, service providers, and CWIC, and the CWICs housed in each region of the state. Once the participant enters employment, the benefits reporting specialist will be available to answer questions, assist in the execution of work incentives plans, 
and assist the, with the submission of income statement and and or impairment or related work expenses or earries to Social Security as required to to the extent needed and indicated by the individual. The benefits reporting specialist service must document the service and activity. The unit is 15 minutes. The service is limited to 12 units or three hours per month. So that's 144 units, 36 hours annually. Personal care services. Personal care services is a range of assistance to enable waiver participants to accomplish tasks that they would normally do for themselves if they did not have a disability. This assistance may take the form of hands-on assistance, actually performing a task for the person, or cueing the person to prompt the, them to perform a, per, a task. Personal care services may be provided um, on a, sporadically, intermittently or on a community on the continuing basis. Personal care services can include assistance with any activity of daily living or independent activities of daily living. They can include such things as bathing, toileting, transferring and ambulation, skin care, grooming, dressing, um, extension of therapies, exercises, routine care of adaptive equipment, meal preparation, assisting with eating, and incidental household cleaning and laundry. In this waiver, we changed um, somewhat and we've limited this service to 12 hours per day for those living in the home with family. For those people that live independently, they may have over the 16 hours a day. What is important here is the documentation needed to support the number of hours assigned. The rate has increased from $3.90 per 15-minute unit to $4.12 per 15-minute unit. ADLs include assistance with shopping, budgeting, using public transportation, social interaction, recreation, and leisure activities. It also includes accompaniment coaching and minor problem solving. Can include supervision only, but requires a plan approved by the regional office. Please note that the direct service provider should be completing a, supervi a supervisory visit done every 60 days. That has, that has changed from 90 days in the previous waiver to 60 days in this waiver. And also this is being changed in the electronic visit verification management system called Authenticare. So just take note of that, that you're going to have to enter those things in every 60 days. The supervisory visits are designed to oversee the personal care worker and ensure that the services are being delivered as expected. The participant should be able to report any problems they have um, with the personal care worker and have them corrected by the supervisor. The QDDP should observe the worker at least two times a year in the home and should document that the worker was present on the form. Please pay attention to this. For those participants currently receiving more than the 12-hour limit, they will continue to receive that amount as authorized services. A needs assessment will have to be completed in order to reduce the number of hours for these participants. The needs assessment must justify the reduction, and we must appeal. We must provide the person with the appeal his appeal rights to if he wants to challenge that decision. The 12-hour limit can be. Um, changed if something happens and their situation changes, maybe the care, 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 primary caregiver actually gets sick or passes away, um, then we can increase those hours. Again, the important part is that we document what we're doing and why we're doing it. Remember that personal 
care under the waiver may also include general supervision and protective oversight reasonable for accomplishing of health, safety, and inclusion. The worker may directly perform some activities and support the client in learning how to perform others. The planning team, composed at the minimum of the person and the family and case manager or community specialist, shall determine the uh, composition of the supervision. If, su if personal care is delivered just for supervision, a written description of what the personal care worker will provide to that person is required to be submitted to, this, to the regional office as part of um, or in addition to the plan of care. The plan will require approval by the Division of Developmental Disabilities and be subject to review by the Alabama Medicaid Agency. Personal care transportation. It must be in incidental to personal care and not the main reason for the service and must, must be described in the person center plan. So therefore, if the person does not need any type of personal care services, they cannot access personal care transportation just for the sake of being transported. It must be needed to support the participant's access to the community. It must not be used to provide mere transportation or um, it must have an end result. So if we're going to the library one day, we need to say, Tuesdays, we're going to the library. If we're going to the movies one day, we need to say in our plan that that's what we're going to do. Um, and it should be based on what the person wants. It cannot play, replace transportation already reimbursable under day or residential services and, and cannot take the place of non-emergency transportation services that are state plan services through Medicaid. Personal care services um, can support people in employment. It's designed to provide assistance with the ADLs or IADLs while somebody's employed. It may be used to support an individual at the work site. It includes general supervision, but if it does include the general supervision, please make sure that you include that uh, detailed plan for the supervision to the regional office. It provides oversight reasonable for health, safety, and inclusion. It can include transportation to and from the job site. It must, be, must support the employment goal as identified um, in the person center plan and on the plan of care. It can be self-directed. The rate has increased um, from the $4.35 per 15-minute unit, unit to $6 per 15-minute unit. It can be a component of other services that cannot comprise the entirety of the service, and it cannot overlap another service. Please, but please note that personal care services to support employment should also be, um, are also subject to the 60-day supervisory visit requirement. Personal care is not available to those under the age of 21. The person should have personal care needs identified through the early periodic screening and diagnostic treatment plan. The supervisory visits are 60 days. The limitations for participants living with parents or guarding is now 12, and the pay payment is 15 minute units. Housing Stabilization Services. The Housing Stabilization Service enables the participant to maintain their own housing as set forth in the, in the plan of care or in the person center plan. These are some of the things that the Housing Stabilization um, or Community Integration Specialist can do. There are five Housing Stabilization Community, community Integration Specialists housed in each across the state, one in each one of the regional offices. So this just lists their duties. Again, everything that's done for a participant has to be included in the person-centered plan. 
It supports interventions for the person center plan. It identifies any additional supports or services that might be needed outside the scope of the housing stabilization services service specialist. Again, housing stabilization services should be authorized and included in the participant center, person center plan and should be on the plan of care and authorized as a service. It's expected to um, help the participant have a safe transition to the community to increase independence. It excludes expenses for monthly rentals or mortgage expenses, food, regular utility charges, and or household appliances or any items that in, are intended for pure diversion or recreational purposes or that are not necessary for the participant's safe transition. Supported living services is a new services that new service that was actually put in the waiver this with this renewal. It's services that include training and assistance in maintaining a home of one's own, a home shared with, with other freely chosen housemates in the community. A home of one's own means a resident not owned or controlled by any waiver service provider. Supported living services support, supports include supports for maintaining home tenancy or ownership, managing money, preparing meals, shopping, maintaining positive relationships with neighbors, opportunities for participation in and in and contribution to the local community, supports to maintain personal appearance and hygiene, support for interpersonal and social skills building through experience with family, friends, and members of the broader community, and other activities needed to maintain and improve the capacity of the individual with an intellectual disability to live in the community. These services shall not shall support and maximize the person's independence through the use of teaching, training, technology, and facilitation of natural support. The service shall support the individual's full integration into the community to, and ensure that the person's choice and rights and fully comport with the standards to the HCBS settings rule. The service also includes the oversight and assistance in managing self-administrated medication and medication administration as permitted under the Alabama Nurse Practices Act and performance of other non-complex health maintenance tasks permitted by state law. Supported living service providers shall monitor the health care needs of the person supported and support the person to attend their own health care needs and our work with natural supports to ensure the person's health care needs are addressed. The service is appropriate for people who are um, who need intermittent staff support to remain in their home, their own home, and do not require 24 hours a day, seven days a week of support. Um, staffing. However, access to emergency ports as needed from the provider on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis is essential um, to this residential to this service, and it differentiates that from personal assistance service. The provider must also ensure that the supported living service participant has an emergency preparedness plan in place at all times. And that it shares that with the support coordinator and the individual is supported to learn and practice this plan at regular intervals. Individuals who are receiving supported living services may choose to receive services in a shared living arrangement. Other persons in the shared living arrangement may need differing levels of support Differing, ty differing types of waiver services or may participate in different home and community-based programs as permitted in the state licensure law and regulations as long as there is a willing, qualified provider who can safely and appropriately meet the needs of each individual in the home. No more than three persons receiving services will be permitted per residence. All individual goals and objectives for supported living services along with a description of the needs or the supporting living supports to achieve these goals and objectives shall be established through the person-centered planning process and documented in the person-centered service 
plan or the, or the plan of care. The circle of support must consider the person's level of independence, availability of natural supports, availability to utilize technology, ability to rely on housemates, neighbors, et cetera, in establishing a supported living arrangement and the service delivery schedule. The supported living service plan must be reviewed at least annually, more often if needed, and changed and updated as the person's needs change. It uh, should take into consideration um, the use of personal emergency response system and other technologies to increase independence when appropriate. The individual service plan or plan of care must reflect the routine supports that will be provided by supported living staff while recognizing the flexibility um, may be needed and desired by the person supported. The person may choose to live with one or two other persons supported and shared living expenses, share living expenses or choose to live alone as long as sufficient financial resources are available to support the chosen arrangement. Payment to providers is based on a monthly fee and service delivery must be appropriate to meet the individual's needs and goals. Transportation may be necessary for some individuals and it is included in the rate to the provider. Here are some limitations on the, on the service. It shall not include the cost of um, maintenance of the dwelling, residential expenses such as phone, cable, TV, food, rent, mortgage, home, renter's insurance, and et cetera. And those shall be paid by the person uh, supported and the other residents uh, and not through um, the use of the service. A person who is receiving supported living services shall not be eligible to receive personal care, companion, or transportation as separate services except for supported employment, transportation, and personal care at the work site. Is, um, personal care is provided within the delivery of the supported living services. The worker must use the EVV authentic care system to clock in and out. They must also take advantage of any state plan services prior to the expenditure of any supported living services. The supported living service provider shall not own the person's place of residence under any circumstance. The provider shall not be a co-signer of a lease on the per person's place of residence unless this is necessary for the person to obtain the lease and the provider signs a written agreement with the person that states that the person will not require to be required to move if the primary reason is because the person desires to change to a different provider. So this means that if the provider signs the lease, they need to have documentation um, that, the, that states the reason and the lease should, not, should be valid even if the participant, participant wants to change the provider. Each participant living in the home should have a freedom of choice of providers, so more than one provider can be delivering services in a home, but, on, but one, one of the participants can only have one self-supported um, living service provider. Any provider that's currently providing residential services who wants to expand into supported living services needs to um, talk to the DD Division Certification Office. More limitations, um, it shall not be provided in any setting that is institutional. It, um, certain family members of the person supported cannot be reimbursed to provide um, the service. Certain, and these include spouse to spouse, parent to child, child to parent, or either appointed as legal guardian and are living with the person. Other family uh, provider qualifications um, may be reimbursed um, as long as certain criteria are met. The service shall not be provided in a home where a person supported lives with family members unless such family members are also persons receiving waiver services. Um, and that's for the ID and living at home waiver. Doesn't include any of the other nursing home level of care waivers such as the ND or the cell waiver. 
family members shall be interpreted to mean the mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, sister, brother, son, daughter, or spouse, whether it's the relationship is by blood, by marriage, or by adoption. Supported living services shall not be provided out of state. And a minimum of two face-to-face -face direct service visits lasting at least one hour is required. Okay, a minimum of two face-to-face -face direct service visits lasting at least one hour in the home per week are required. So that means you have to go two hours a week to visit each participant. You can't go one hour and visit all three or, all, or both or anything like that. You have to visit each participant two hours um, each week, so one hour twice a week. The self-directed, I mean, I'm sorry, the supported living services should also uh, have be available to each participant 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the event of an emergency. So now let's talk about residential service. There was nothing in this um, service that changed in the renewal. It um, may be provided to group homes certified by the department. Um, it must be related to, um, to identified plan goals. The residential services must be selected by the individual. It offers individualized services and support as identified by the person center plan and enabling acquisition, retention, or improvement of skills necessary to reside in the community-based setting that supports independence and full integration into the broader community. It offers opportunity to seek employment, engage in community life, control personal resources, and receive res services in the community to the same degree of access of the individuals not receiving any home and community-based services. The individual has the right to a rental agreement that is fully enforceable. It provides care, supervision, and skills training in daily living, home management, and community integration. There, here are the requirements for those providers who are, are providing specialized medical residential services to our um, participants. So put this slide in there just so you would have that information. Again, here's the one, um, the requirements for those providers that are providing specialized behavioral services to some of our participants. Um, None of this changed in the renewal document, but I will point out that when you are providing this service, if any of your level one, two, or three people change, you have to notify the regional office community service director and send the new credentials on the new person to them so they have it on file. Here's more about the um, specialized behavioral service residential requirements. Okay, in-home re residential habilitation has been removed from this waiver and it has been replaced with supported living services. For those people that have, are currently receiving um, this service, they will continue to receive their, the service at the same rate indicated on the plan of care. Please note, though, that the billing cannot exceed more than eight hours per day, and it cannot include the cost of room and board. Um, just wanted you to be aware of that. Again, those participants currently receiving um, more than the eight-hour limit will continue to receive, or I'm sorry, those participants currently receiving more than or the eight-hour limit will continue to get that service. Um, a needs assessment will have to be completed in order to reduce the number of hours or to do away with the service. Anytime that the service is um, 
changed, then people should be sent their rights to appeal those decisions. Respite services. There, uh, of course, respite care is a service provided in or outside a family's home to temporarily relieve the unpaid primary caregiver. Um, it provides short-term care to an adult or child for a brief period of rest or relief from the family from day-to-day -day caregiving for a dependent family member. Um, it is a service provided in the home or outside the home. Respite care is dependent on the individual's needs and of course it's, it has to be outlined in the um, person center plan and also on the plan of care. It's limited to um, 180 hours um, or 45 days. That also equates to 4,320 15 minute units. So none of this changed with the current, within the current waiver renewal. Nothing changed about community companion services. So there, you know, is what um, is comprised of the service. So just be aware of that. The one I want to point out is that the supervisory visit must be completed every 90 days. In the previous waiver, it did say every 60 days. However, uh, it has been changed every 90 days. The reason that these, the supervisory visits for personal care services and for companion services was changed was to align it better with the other waivers across the state. Um, theirs has always been 60 days supervisory visits for personal care and 90 days for companion services and for our waiver uh, it was right the opposite, so we um, work with Medicaid to um, make it align better with what other waivers we're doing in the state. Please note also that the adult companion services is only available for those on the ID waiver. There's some services that are included um, in companion services. They can go into the community with um, the, the person as long as they're dropped off. Um, companion service transportation is not a service in the waiver, so just be aware of that. Okay, so community, community specialist service, um, been in the waiver for many, many years and never really utilized. I think the utilization, we used it twice in those many years, and so never could really find a place that it should go and how to utilize that um, service. So it has been deleted from the waiver as a service. What I wanna note about specialized medical equipment, um, we changed the name to assistive technology. Nothing about the service really changes. We just added um, assistive technology to broaden the definition a little bit and so what you have in the on the slide pictures on the slide is actually um, some specialized medical equipment assistive technology can be um, outside that so uh, it's an item piece of equipment uh, including any equipment not covered by state plan services it can be a service animal or product system which acquired which can be acquired commercially it can be modified to customize that individual's needs. Um, must be used to, you know, increase a person's independence and autonomy in the community. It means that a service that is directly designed to assist an individual in the selection, acquisition, or use of assistive technology um, device that also includes an evaluation by um, an expert. It can be purchasing, leasing, or otherwise providing the acquisition of assistive technology. It can be services consisting of selecting, designing, fitting, customizing, or adapting and applying um, or repairing, replacing assistive technology devices. So we added this basically just to broaden the definition and not have that service tied directly to medical needs.
So it can include any specialized medical equipment, um, devices, controls, or appliances specified in the service plan and on the plant, a person center plan, which enables the recipient to increase their ability to perform activities of daily living um, or to perceive, control, or communicate with the environment in which they live. So included items are those necessary for life support, ancillary supplies, and equipment necessary for the proper functioning of such items, and durable and non-durable medical equipment not available under the state plan. Providers of this service must maintain the documentation of items purchased for each individual. Again, when we, you know, this requires assistive technology, it requires the um, case manager or support coordinator to submit the request for action from the regional office, community service director for approval for all expenditures. So your documentation should support um, what the assistive technology is intended to do and how and the outcome of the assistive technology and how that would change the person's life. Here are some examples of some um, timers that um, a person can use to um, remind them to take medication. Specialized medical equipment and assistive technology will have to have the prescriptions for the participant's pre uh, doctor. Um, again, state plan services available through the uh, Alabama Medicaid Agency and again I'm going to remind you of the link that I gave you at the beginning of the PowerPoint presentation because you need to be checking those um, resources to see if that uh, an item is covered by Medicaid before we expend waiver funds. The payment that you receive will be for the cost, the actual cost of the item. There's a $5,000 per year per individual maximum cost. This service is not available for children under the 20, under age 21 and younger. Um, should be covered through their EPSDT services, um, and they always always have to be used prior to expending uh, waiver funds. Self-directed um, medical equipment or assistive technology is only available to those participants who are also self-directing either personal care, companion services, or LPN RN services. Environmental accessibility adaptations. Nothing changed in this um, service in the waiver for this renewal period. Um, just want to make sure that you understand that, you know, you can get a physical therapist to um, and use that service to do an evaluation to determine, you know, uh, what is needed um, as far as the home modification and that all services should be provided, provided in accordance with applicable state, local, and building codes as well as ADA standards. The individual's home may be a house or apartment that is owned, rented, or leased. Any uh, home modifications um, should be, again, made to the ADA standards. Um, if somebody is leasing a home, then it's really the it's really that um, owner's responsibility to make the home accessible. In the event that that you know causes a hardship to that provider or the the owner, then there are some things that can be done, um, you know, some adaptation so that can be done as long as whatever is provided, such as a portable ramp, can be taken if that participant moves to another location and it can be modified. So just um, bear that in mind. Um, the payment, of course, are the unit of services, the job. There's a $5,000 um, per year per individual cap. And please note that this does not have to have a prescription from the person's doctor. Specialized medical supplies are supplies that are reimbursed under the, um, for the participant 
but it does not include common over-the-counter personal care items and items that are of not direct medical or remedial benefit. So it does not include items such as soap, cotton swab, toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, or sanitary items or supplies otherwise furnished under Medicaid state plan. Again, you need to go back and look at those, those chapters in the provider manual and or the fee schedule to make sure that whatever that person needs is not already covered under state plan services because a waiver is, you know, the, we're going to be the payer of last resort. Um, all should meet applicable designs and manufactured designs, make sure that they're, you know, appropriate for the individual and the individual can, can use them. Again, shall not include over-the-counter personal care items. So just want to bring that attention to that. Costs for the medical supplies that are limited to $1,800 per year per individual must be prescribed by the participant's physician. Um, that medical supply prescription should be um, as detailed as possible. So we make sure that, you know, we have it covered at the time of a Medicaid audit. Um, make sure it's not. Um, uh, being used by those kids under the age of 18 because that should be covered under their EPSDT um, services. Self-directed specialized medical services um, are available for those who are self-directing personal care, companion, and or LPN and RN services. Individual goods and services. Um, did not change in this waiver, it's, and these individual goods and services are only available to those persons who are self-directing um, their services and have some what, um, savings from wage negotiations with their workers. So if a person is actually paying um, their worker the maximum amount of allowable, um, the there will be no savings and individual goods and services cannot be used. Um, we did a little bit of changing and we increased the amount that, that the person can save from $1,000 um, to $10,000. And this is um, to allow for those um, services that, you know, like a maybe a van lift or some some dental work or something that's really big. Um, so just wanted you to be aware of that. Okay. Personal emergency response services. It includes um, installation, which we anticipate should not cost more than any, you know, than $500 for the installation and testing. The monthly monitoring, we've estimated that at, at you know, um, about $83 per month. So the total cost per participant per year is limited to $1,500 to $3,000. Um, it's not available to persons receiving residential services, and it's appropriate for those who can operate responsibility, you know, responsibly. So just bear that in mind. Um, CMS restricts the use of cameras for surveillance, so just be a uh, aware of that and again this is for the individual and it's designed to help that person um, to emergency help in the event that they're living alone or in the supported living environment so um, just um, be aware of that. Occupational therapy services did not change during this waiver renewal, and so everything remains the same for this service. Do want to point out that you know that that it does require um, physicians' uh, prescription. The occupational therapist has to do an evaluation. It's time limited um, to 50 hours or 200 units um, per allowed per occurrence, so let me explain that a little bit, that if a person comes in and they have something going on um, with their arm and they receive the 50 hours or 200 units, then for that occurrence, 
if something happens and they fall and they hurt the other arm and they need additional occupational therapy, that's a new occurrence. So they would have, uh, again, the 50 hours or 200 units available. But um, uh, just be aware that there are some limits in there. It's not available for those kids under the age of 21. Um, so it's covered through their EPSDT screening, and if they need that service, it will be covered um, through by Alabama Medicaid. Group therapy is not allowed. I want to point out, too, that the documentation that the provider's service must maintain a service log that documents specific days on which the physical therapies or occupational therapy services were delivered. Um, the OT must document each therapy session in a treatment note and must sign each note denoting whether or not the progress has been made. Um, we did take out the OT visit. Um, it's not required to uh, clock in and out through the electronic visit, um, the authentic care system anymore. Physical therapy is the same as occupational therapy. Again, it has to have the doctor's prescription um, to start the service, and then the physical therapist is required to do an evaluation and a treatment plan that outlines everything that, the, that should be done, the frequency of the service, the goal of the service, and that should be there um, to support the need for the service. Uh, so just be aware of that. Again, there are some limitations um, on that. Um, same as it is with occupational therapy, at 50 hours or 200 units per occurrence. So just be aware of that. We're not limiting, um, you know, the total service availability to people. It's just that um, we're breaking it down per occurrence. It's not an, designed to be an ongoing service, um, especially not for range of motion. Those are things that um, the, per the family or the primary caregiver or the workers can be trained by the physical therapist, occupational therapist to do um, after physical therapist actually services are ended. Again, you know, the documentation um, has to include um, the service log that documents specific days on which physical therapy services were delivered and that um, document each treatment note and uh, they have to sign it each each time uh, and denote whether or not the pro progress is being made. Positive behavior support has not changed. Those three, three still the same, three different levels of this service. So um, there's your information and you can um, make sure that you are following those. Uh, I will point out that a behavior um, Support plan um, can only be implemented after um, implemented after positive behavior approaches have been tried. Other approaches have been applied. Um, also, want you to know that you know it is required that every 90 days you have to have this renewed. So make sure you're working with your regional office and submitting whatever documentation they need to see to have the authorization uh, continue at the current rate. So please be aware of that. Okay, this talks about um, the levels of positive behavior services. I want to point out here that self-directed um, positive behavior supports was removed uh, as an option of service simply because there was um, no utilization of this service. So, and the administrative burden to the employer of record was quite significant. So, just wanted to make sure that um, you are aware of that. Process intervention, nothing in process intervention services changed during this waiver renewal. So if you're providing that service or you want to know a little bit more about that service, just um, there's your information and what it's used for, but it's, it can be delivered in the home or out of the home. Most of the time uh, when we see that service being utilized, it is done in a residential facility. It is um, also um, has a 10 week limit. So no participant can get over 10 weeks during the waiver year. 
more information about process intervention. Speech therapy services, again, um, have to have a prescription. Nothing in this changed um, during this waiver renewal, but uh, it is, um, you know, billed at the encounter rate, and so limited to one encounter a day. Um, speech therapy, you know, is supposed to have, it's, again, a plan is required. Um, they must have a prescription from the, the person's physician. The speech therapist has to do an evaluation and then develop the treatment plan according to the evaluation, and the plan must state the goals of the therapy. So um, more about that right there. So there's a way that, you know, if it, additional services is, is needed, then um, they can be requested. It's not available to those kids under the age of 21. Um, because that's covered through their early periodic screening diagnostic treatment program. Again, the per provider has to maintain a service log, you know, and tells us what they did on certain days and whether or not services have been uh, made. It is not included in the electronic visit verification monitoring system. It was at one time, but we removed that. Nursing services, nothing about nursing services changed in this waiver renewal, so um, still still the same as it was. Just want you to be aware of that. Not available to those kids under the age of 21. That's covered through their APSDT, so if we have someone that is living um, in residential who's also under the age of 21, that service has to be provided by one of the Medicaid's five providers. That letter went out um, last week to all providers and to all um, persons who were receiving that service. Just remember, I uh, tried to stress this during the presentation, that, you know, the person is the reason that we're here to provide the service not, um, you know, not anything else. So it's all individualized very much based on that person-centered planning. That's the, the, the key to all service and, and the development of the plan of care. Just remember that early periodic screening diagnostic um, treatment um, is for those persons under the age of 21 and CMS had came, come in a couple of years ago and told the state that we were not supposed to be providing personal care services, medical supplies, positive behavior support, process intervention, assistive technology, uh, or DME, medical um, or nursing services to those kids. Um, for those kids that um, we identified under the age of 21 that was getting personal care, um, the personal care transportation is not covered by the EPSDT services. So for those that were currently getting personal care as a waiver services, their personal care transportation will still be covered. Residential services will still be covered. And what we have encouraged uh, case management and um, the regional office to do is to try to find a service that's not a waiver service that's not covered through EPSDT that um, we can make available to participants so they don't lose their waiver slot. Um, the participants whose match is paid from DHR or by the local education agency are exempt from this, from this EPSDT program requirement. Let's talk a little bit about MSIQ checks and the, and the um, and why these are important. Um, they, you know, we have to do those and, and we should be keeping a check on these. Um, providers should be responsible for that. Um, one of the easiest ways to do an MSIQ check to make sure a person continues their Medicaid eligibility so you can bill for services to go into Adidas and look under the fund eligibility page that um, is updated every, at the first of every month. And so, 
You can see here that it will tell you their start date and end date. So the person that we pulled up here is eligible for services for this month. If that is not there, if the current month is not there, then you need to call the regional office and have them do go into the MSIQ and check that and see if we can determine what's wrong. Um, Lindy Watson here at the central office is always available to help you to, um, check him, you know, the MSIQ. Um, we did make available to um, case management and uh, service coordination that uh, way they can go into the Medicaid provider portal and check uh, each person's eligibility. They also can be checked, you know, by telephone, by dialing the 1-800 number. Um, that takes a little time, but it's important that, you know, we check this and make sure that persons are eligible for the service in order for our providers to get paid. We want to get you paid for the services that you provide. So if you see a problem, don't hesitate to call the regional office or um, Lindy and let's see if we can track down uh, what the problem is and get it rectified pretty quickly so you continue to get paid. Redeterminations, the support coordinators can um, begin that process, um, you know, now 60 days in advance. I think there was some, um, what I call DMH uh, folklore that said 45, no more than 45 days. Um, that's not the case, but I did go ahead and put it in the, the um, waiver that they can start within, you know, at least by 60 days. Um, the paperwork shouldn't be held for lack of um, a signature. That's not something that Medicaid would accept as a reason that we shouldn't process the paperwork. So as you're out there and, you know, with the uh, if we don't have a guardian or we or the parent's not available to sign, just have that um, waiver participant make an X and somebody witness, you know, that that's the person's X and that you witnessed them making that X and the date that you witnessed it. So, um, and go ahead and submit that to the regional office. Um, you know, we're not going to hold a prescription, we're not going to hold uh, any redetermination paperwork because of, we're, we're way down on the prescription for service. That's the support coordinator's responsibility to make sure that that service has the prescription every year. So um, just be aware of that. Um, we're trying to process all redeterminations by the last working day of the month. So we try to get them and we try to space them out over the month. Uh, just note that Lindy is processing anywhere from four to 500 redeterminations each month, so it's, a, it's imperative that we get those processed in a timely manner. For questions or comments, you know, you can send um, those questions, uh, call the central office or call your regional office. They've had the same presentation and um, previously, and so um, they have they can answer any questions or should be able to answer any questions that you have. The PowerPoint presentation will be sent to each of the providers. It will also be placed on our website for your convenience and you can just go in and download it. The training itself will be put uh, on the website so uh, along with a service catalog that we're working on. So all of that will be up on the website and you can have access uh, to it at all times so as your your um, staff changes, then you know you also have access to the training. So um, I want to thank you for all that you do uh, every day to to help and assist the people that we serve. Um, it does not go without um, notice. So just want you to know that we appreciate everything you do. So thank you very much. <laughs>